Are the 2015 and 2017 MacBook Airs the best valued MacBooks in 2020? For the past two years, I've made videos showing that these MacBook Airs stand the test of time and are still the best affordable MacBooks to date. Does this statement still hold true in 2020? How do they compare to the latest generation of laptops? And should I buy an x86 MacBook today when ARM Apple Silicone MacBooks are coming out next year? Stay tuned for more. Let's first talk about the configuration options. Back in 2015 and 2017, Apple sold multiple variants of the 13-inch MacBook Airs. We'll go into the power differences later in the video, but in a nutshell, the Core i5 and i7 processor speed differences in both the 2015 and 2017 models aren't very significant today. But I do recommend that you at least purchase a MacBook Air with 8GB of RAM. I'm still rocking the 8GB variant with a dual-core 1.6GHz Intel Core i5-5250U processor with turbo boosting up to 2.7GHz. Yeah, that's a mouthful. The SSD storage sizes can range anywhere from 128GB to 512GB of genuine Apple storage. 256GB isn't necessary for most people, and since these SSDs can be upgraded easily on your own at a later date if needed, if you find a better deal on eBay for the 128GB version, you should be perfectly fine. See a link above to my storage upgrade video tutorial. Currently, you can buy the 8GB version refurbished on Amazon with 128 gigabytes of SSD storage for almost $700. And on eBay, the same version is selling for around $500. Yeah, these things really hold their value. So what causes them to be so great? Let's start with the gold standard of keyboards. The backlit keys feel better than all Apple butterfly keys manufactured from 2015 to 2019, as well as the traditional scissor style keys in the 2020 MacBook Airs and Pros. Yes, I'm saying this is better than the latest generation of Apple keyboards. The 1.4 millimeters of key travel in this laptop just feels better than the 1.0 millimeters of key travel in the 2020 MacBooks and feels way better than the 0.7 and 0.8 millimeters of key travel in the butterfly keys from 2015 to 2019. Some might say that these older keys are a little mushy, but I feel like the increased key travel lets me type on them much more quietly than any MacBook keyboard sold since. Now the glass trackpad also sets a gold standard in my opinion. Other than the 2020 Razorblade Stealth reviewed above, I have used no other Windows laptop with such a premium trackpad. The cool glass smooth texture feels premium and has a sensitivity that rivals the touchscreen on an iPhone. Some might say that it's too small and lacks force touch from the latest generation of MacBooks, but I, just, I say you're wrong. I haven't found a time when I absolutely needed to use Force Touch. Let me know in the comments if there is something you need it for. Apple is already ditching the technology in their latest generation of phones. Regarding the trackpad's size, I think it's perfect. The latest generation of MacBooks with their extra large trackpads sometimes register false clicks from my palms while I'm typing, causing me to essentially delete and write over previous text in some instances. This issue is non-existent when I use an appropriately sized trackpad in the 2015 and 2017 MacBook Air. And finally, these MacBooks still include a traditional diving board style trackpad. As a result, you can't register a click anywhere on the trackpad like you can on the latest MacBooks. But for me, I just use tap to click like on my iPhone, so it doesn't bother me. As for the ports, the 13-inch MacBook Airs include an outstanding selection of them. You will get two USB 3 Type-A ports with speeds up to 5 gigabits per second, a Thunderbolt 2 port with speeds up to 20 gigabits per second, a MagSafe 2 power port, I love that it's magnetic, an SD card slot, and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. I love that this thing has useful ports. USB Type-A is great for external mice and other peripherals. An SD card slot is necessary for anyone with a camera or who wants to post on YouTube. And a headphone jack is always appreciated. Even though these speeds aren't as fast as the Thunderbolt 3's 40 gigabits per second speeds, for what I'm doing, the transfer speeds are just fine. And I'll gladly sacrifice speed for convenience. Am I the only one who hates dongles? Let me know in the comments. Moving to the speakers, you might say that they sound a bit tinny, but they get up there in volume if necessary without any blaring. That said, if you want the best quality of sound, I recommend using headphones or speakers in a 3.5mm headphone jack or Apple's AirPods. They pair super easily with the MacBook Air and I highly recommend them. 
The super slim size and weight allows you to multitask without having to sacrifice portability. I mean, this laptop started the Ultrabook trend almost a decade ago, so there are no complaints from me. Starting at only 0.68 inches at its widest point, it tapers to just 0.11 inches at its thinnest point due to its wedge-shaped design. And weighing 2.9 pounds, only a tenth of a pound more than the latest 2020 MacBook Air, this laptop slides easily into a bag without weighing you down. One downside many YouTube reviewers started complaining about in 2017 was the TN panel. Compared to the high resolution IPS displays used in Apple's latest generation of laptops, the colors here aren't as accurate, the viewing angles aren't as good, and the text is slightly blurrier due to the lower resolution screen. That said, if color accuracy isn't that important to you, you position the screen so that it faces you directly, and you don't hold your eye an inch or two away from the screen to look at individual pixels, then you should be just fine with the 2015 and 2017 MacBook Air's screens. I actually prefer this screen over IPS displays because this lower resolution TN panel uses less power than the Retina displays used in the latest generation of MacBooks. Therefore, the battery life in these MacBook Airs excel. How long do they last? Apple claimed 12 hours of battery life. They have never claimed that much battery life before, and they haven't since. Realistically, I get around 10 hours of mixed usage, and your mileage may vary depending on what you're doing and what your screen brightness is set to. Don't use Chrome. But still, no other MacBook has ever tested this high. What about the longevity of the battery? Over the past three years, I've gone through 542 cycles, and since they are rated for 1,000 cycles, I should get at least another three years of use from this laptop without seeing any degradation in battery life. Therefore, if like me, you want a laptop that will last a long time each day for many years, then you can't go wrong with these 2015 and 2017 MacBook Airs. But what happens if your battery gets to the end of its life and does start to drain more quickly? Unlike Apple's latest generation of MacBooks, the 2015 and 2017 MacBook Airs can still be easily upgraded. You have the ability to replace the SSD and the battery. You can even replace the keyboard keys if you're having issues with them, which you shouldn't. Regarding the hard drive, Apple uses a proprietary SSD. Third-party manufacturers make adapters for to use standard SSDs, but all of these options tend to reduce the MacBook Air's battery life and sometimes force it into reboot loops. Therefore, if you replace or upgrade the SSD, please make sure you are getting a genuine Apple SSD. It's worth the additional cost, trust me. Replacing the batteries are super easy as well. Amazon has replacement batteries for only 60 bucks. So if you purchased a used 2015 MacBook Air 13 inch with 999 cycles on the battery and it doesn't have enough storage for you, you still have options. Regarding the processor, for the past two years, I've said that a dual core Intel x86 processor from 2015 is just fine. Does that still hold true in 2020? Well, now we have to take a look at two things, the dual core aspect as well as the Intel x86 aspect. Regarding the number of cores, most laptops these days are shipped with quad core CPUs. The 2015 MacBook Air has an older dual core processor. Is that okay for most people? The short answer is yeah, absolutely. My 2015 MacBook Air gets a Geekbench 5 multi-core score of 1300. How does that compare to the 2020 MacBook Air? <laughs> well. The quad-core 2020 MacBook Air is technically three times faster on paper with a multi-core score of 3600, but that's only the more expensive Core i5 and Core i7 quad-core models. Their $1,000 Core i3 dual-core version only gets a multi-core score of 2400, which is still almost twice as fast as their 2015 MacBook Air, but running the test three times in a row drops the 2020 MacBook Air's scores by 400 points due to the improper cooling in the latest generation of MacBook Airs. I mean, come on, Apple. Why would you disconnect a fan from a heatsink? Unless you're planning on changing to a much cooler Apple ARM CPU in a few months. And that brings us to the topic of the Intel x86 processor in this laptop. Do I think that you should buy a new MacBook in 2020 with an Intel processor when Apple is going to release MacBooks with ARM processors moving forward starting next year? No, I do not think that you should buy a new MacBook. But if you can find a good deal on a used 2015 MacBook Air, then go for it, absolutely. On my MacBook Air, I'm still able to browse the web, write scripts, take notes, and watch YouTube and Netflix videos with hundreds of tabs open in my Safari browser, and I haven't noticed any slowdown. Again, don't use Chrome. 
And that's because Apple is pretty good about supporting older hardware on older operating systems. Oh, and I also wanted to briefly touch the differences between the 2015 and 2017 MacBook Airs. They are physically identical from a chassis standpoint. The 1.6 to 1.8 gigahertz processor bump shows an approximate 10 to 13% better performance, but the same processor is being used. It's just clocked at a slightly higher frequency. This is not a significant enough upgrade boost for me, but if you can find a 2017 model at a good deal, then why not? Go for it. There is no change to the screen, keyboard, storage, and RAM between the 2015 and 2017 models. Speaking of the RAM, as I said before, do not buy a computer today with anything less than 8 gigabytes of it. Period. And you only really need 16 gigabytes of RAM if you are gaming, which you should never do on a MacBook. That said, let's run some benchmarks and do it anyways. The integrated Intel HD Graphics 6000 has an OpenCL score of 3800. The 2020 MacBook Air gets double, but the performance on this laptop is still capable of playing older games at low settings. The fans will kick in, but they aren't loud. CSGO only ran in the 40s at 720p, and it sometimes dipped down into the 30s with some slight stutter. And when I tested the MacBook Air last year, I was able to get 37 FPS at 720p low settings in Tomb Raider, but now it won't boot. I read online that updating from High Sierra to Mojave fixes this issue, but I'm still not happy. What happens next year? I'm not upgrading to Catalina on this thing, as I'm not willing to lose support for all my 32-bit apps and games. On the other hand, Google Stradia, GeForce Now, Steam in-home streaming, and more are great ways to game on this MacBook. The battery life and fan noise during gaming are also improved when you stream the games over the cloud. In conclusion, if you want one of the best valued MacBooks at a great price, one that has a great keyboard and trackpad, one with top-of-the-line battery life, one with an excellent size and weight, one with a multitude of ports to choose from without using dongles, and one that's upgradable, the 13-inch MacBook Air 2015 and 2017s are for you. Just remember, they lack Thunderbolt 3, they have an older generation TN panel, and they only have an older x86 Intel dual-core processor. Regardless, I'll still be rocking my 2015 MacBook Air for a few more years to come. But what do you guys think? Do you still use your 2015 or 2017 MacBook Airs as your daily driver? And let me know in the comments what you'd like to see me test next. And finally, hit the like and subscribe button. It really does help the channel out, and I'll catch you in the next one.